Today is a case study from the Riverina Local Land Services Farming Smarter Project. Uh, Alison joined Holbrook Landcare Network in 2021 after a 19-year career in agricultural science as an agricultural scientist and lecturer at Charles Sturt Uni. Alison completed a PhD in native grassland e ecophysiology. She nearly got me there. That's a hard one. Um, before turning her attention to teaching and researching pasture management, agricultural systems and extension, workplace learning and curriculum design. In addition to uh, uh, Holbrook Landcare Network, Alison manages a commercial fine wool merino enterprise and is mother to two girls. And she will cover off on her paddock that was involved in our uh, Farming Smarter project. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Yes, yeah, so today I'm, well, for, for the moment, I'm putting on my farmer hat. Um, yeah, I was privileged to uh, be selected to participate in the Farming Smarter program. Uh, a few years ago, and it was really timely for us. Um, my husband and I are self-starters in farming. We leased a, f a family, my family farm for a few years, and then we purchased a small block, and we're gradually purchasing all those blocks that no one else wants, because we can afford them, and we're trying to improve them. So we're now at about 1,500 acres. We have got it to about 2,500 head of merino ewes that we're running and um, we're doing it while we're both working almost full time. So it's a little bit of a challenge, but that's what you do when you're trying to get into farming, I guess. So we purchased a, a 500 acre block called Turkey Flat um, back uh, a couple of, in 2019. Um, and before I get to that, I just thought I'd say I'm, I'm, I'm basically going to talk about our experience through the Farming Smarter program, why we participated, a bit of a plan for how we did it, what we sowed, how successful was it, what we learnt, and we did learn quite a lot. This is a picture of Turkey Flat when we first purchased it back in 2019. Uh, 500 acres, and, and look, it was flogged. Uh, when we purchased it, it had been leased for a number of years. Uh, when we turned up there to, in, uh, to inspect the property, there were animal welfare issues, cattle that were really unhealthy because they just had eaten everything out and were not doing well. Um, and prior to the lease, it had actually been uh, continuously cropped for 10 years. So the ryegrass resistance we discovered was out of control. So when we burnt purchased this block, we could argue quite strongly that uh, we knew that there was work to do. <laughs> and from that photo, you can see just the extent of sorrel in the paddock there. There was quite a lot of um, silver grass, some small patches of red grass over the back, but in summer it was just hairy panic. And it was, you could tell just by looking at those species that there was a lot of work to do. So the, the Smart, Farming Smarter program basically was a program run by Lisa Castleman out of um, Riverina LLS here in Wagga. And it was about trying to encourage producers to, uh, to soil test and based on those soil tests, improve pastures with perennial pastures. And effectively, that was what we were planning to do anyway. Um, there was such an obvious need for pasture improvement that it was a major limitation to us being able to make any money out of it. So it was really quite an obvious thing that we had to do. Um, and the species present indicated that there was major acid soil issues, but we didn't really know to what extent or how extensive. So the, why we really wanted to get into this was because it would help us fast track that pasture improvement program that we thought we had ahead of us. So we were trying to answer these sorts of questions. How severe, to what depth was it acid? How much lime do we apply? All those basic questions that when you purchase a property, you try and answer. So we got a lot of soil test results from this. What happened was, um, I think it was Precision Ag came out and grid sample tested 50 hectares of the farm which turned out to be three, three paddocks. And um, 
produced soil test results and they were tested at 0 to 10 centimetres and 10 to 20 centimetres. From this, we were able to um, get soil test results, as you can see there, and the red bar you can see is soil acidity. So it was sitting quite low. And obviously, being um, grid sampled, it varied across the paddocks. Um, they also, the recommendations, the lime recommendations were based on a, a formula, the same formula for 0 to 10 to 10 to 20 centimetres for, to, to calculate lime, and it offered two pH targets that you could aim for at 5.2 or 5.8 pH. Uh, and when we looked at those prescriptions, and I'll show you some maps in a second, um, we, the, the applications recommended, depending on which um, target you wanted to focus for, whether it was 5.2 or 5.8, um, varied considerably. We ended up choosing a, the 5.2 target um, because of the timeline and the, and the, the amount that, of lime that was required to do it. And in total, we did this over two applications. So before the program, um, started, we'd already put on two and a half tonnes, just straight across the whole lot, and then we came back uh, with um, a, the prescription variable rate rates after that. So it was a lot of lime in a very short period of time. So here's some examples of the maps. This, I've chosen one of the paddocks, which we called Trig Hill. It was probably our biggest problem paddock, and it was quite sloping. Um, the one with all the red is the 0 to 10, and the, 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 the brown is the, the 10 to 20 centimetres. And you, you won't be able to read it there, but the red is around the 4.3, 4.4 pH. The orange on the first map of the 0 to 10 is, is 4.9, and the pink's around that 4.5. When you get to depth, the brown is 4 pH and the red is obviously 4.3. So you can see major acidity issues. We also um, then had a variable rate lime uh, prescription put over the top, and the highest uh, rate that we did, uh, that was recommended to us, I should say, for the 5.2 was, uh, what was it? It was about seven and a half tonne. And if we switch over to the 5.8, the top was 11 tonne per hectare, which we kind of went, well, the paddock's going to be white. Um, probably given the timeline of this project, not realistic. So we paired back and we put on as much as we could, um, but we, we decided to go for the 5.2. So we know that there's still a lot of work to be done. So as I said, two and a half tonne, done in 2019, and I think this was just before the testing, so I don't think the testing was affected. Um, and then being self-starters, we didn't have any great way to incorporate at that point in time, and the paddocks were quite variable as well. So we didn't really want to risk deep ripping because of the slopes on those paddocks. We were worried about erosion. So at the time, incorporation was limited to time um, disturbance at sowing, and that was it. So I was pretty much top dressed. The picture there is um, my husband's gear. So we, fortunately, I married a, a spreading and spraying contractor. So variable rate technology or access to it was not an issue. It was just the incorporation. So the main temperate pasture mix that we were aiming for across the paddock um, was mostly a temperate pasture mix. Uh, it was a mixture of Phalaris, Coxfoot, Subclover, and Balanza Clover. Cognizant of what um, Richard was saying earlier, I had, I was very conscious of making the mix too complex. Um, the subclovers, obviously, we wanted to have a range of um, uh, maturity lengths in there. And um, we also, because of the variable slopes, we wanted to make sure that we had some species that were going to be able to cope with waterlogging. Um, 
I'm always very conscious of Valera stag, as I've been, I've been hit with that before, and I'm a little bit of a fan of Coxfoot, and the hilltops of these paddocks were quite grabbly. And so it was really quite a good opportunity to try, try Coxfoot, and my plan was that the Phalaris at least would be good down the bottom of the hill and the Coxfoot at the top. So that's why we went with the mix that we did. Um, we also delayed sowing these pastures for as long as possible. Because we knew that there was ryegrass issues in the paddocks, we wanted to have as long a clean-up phase as possible um, before we, tried, we attempted to, to establish. So this is a bit of a map of the whole farm. And um, the paddock that I was showing you is the TTH, that's Trig Hill, the 19 hectares in the yellow at the top. And it was the one that we put most of our, or started with the most effort early. Um, we started with triticale, and then we went to canola, um, and then we, we sprayed it out, and we put in our pasture mix. And we had a number of challenges with that. Uh, but the paddock, the other yellow paddock right at the front, the TT, that stands for triangle, see the shape there? Pretty smart, hey? Um, that was also a paddock that we, we wanted to do a bit more um, clean-up phase in, but given slope and a few other challenges with work, etc., we couldn't get on early enough to do that. But we did get a really good control of the canola early in, that, in, that, in 2022, and we put a pasture mix in there in 2023 on time. Uh, the third paddock was supposed to be the cattle yards paddock, which is the red one right in the middle, CPY, 30 hectares. Um, we realised after starting that with a, with a canola in the first year that we were going to have, we really have our work cut out with this ryegrass. We attempted to do a few more things, but we, what we realised was that paddock really needed more years of cropping phase to be able to get on top of that ryegrass. So we switched actually in from that paddock to the blue paddock TP, which stands for the pines. Uh, you can see a few trees in there. Uh, and our plan, because we didn't have that clean-up phase as long as we needed, we were really constrained by the length of this project, uh, was to put in as many broad leaves as we could, to keep out grasses for a number of years and, and trial a, a chicory with the hope maybe of when the chicory, which we know is a perennial but is a generally short-lived compared to most, um, with the plan to potentially try a tropical pasture in that phase, in that paddock, in, in five years' time. Um, every year we've fertilised these paddock, paddock with these paddocks with about 150 kilograms per hectare of superphosphate as well. So ongoing fertility improvements at the same time. So yes, thanks husband for changing paddocks on me halfway through, but that's okay. Was it a success? Well, it's, we're still not sure. It's, it's, it's happening still and we've got one more sowing this autumn to do. The photos you can see there of, uh, of um, Trig Hill, and particularly the top paddock, you can see on the, on the margins of the leaves there, the canola, some, some, some pretty severe yellowing. Um, we think that we, the lack of incorporation actually was a real problem for us. Um, I think we actually caused severe stratification, and we actually, when we pulled up plants, we actually found J roots in there. We also suspect that we actually uh, happened to cause trace element issues uh, in the process. So that the short period of applying lime uh, really played against us in, in Trig Hill and subsequently when we did go in with the pasture um, phase, it really struggled. Um, in Triangle Paddock where we did get a successful establish early on, we were, I was a bit nervous. We, we got good um, germination and then the season changed on us and we, we, whilst we went in a couple of times with slug management, you can see at the bottom of the slope on that bigger photo there that we did have patches that actually just got slammed with slugs and it was way too wet to actually get on and actually do much about it um, after that. But that's the paddock now in, in Triangle. And you can see this was take, taken in January this year. Uh, on the right-hand side, you, with all the green, believe it or not, that's mostly Coxfoot. 
it's actually done really well. We had um, really good clover establishment in, in those areas, all except for where um, those seeps were coming out. There was about three or f three months where there was certain parts of the paddock was just underwater. And, um, and, but the rest of the paddock is actually doing really quite well. Um, so, um, and, and the paddock on the, on the left is one that we haven't yet improved. It's an annual pasture. So in terms of feed production, you can really see that there's, it really has helped widen that, um, that growing season for us. So I'm really excited to get a few more paddocks in like this. Come back to me in a couple more years and hopefully it'll be a really different landscape there. Um, in terms of how this project has helped, it has definitely um, helped with expenses. Covering, the seed, covering part of the seed costs and some of the soil testing costs. It did enable more comprehensive soil testing than we would have done otherwise. Um, we probably would have located, you know, taken samples from representative parts of the paddock, different slopes and, and so on, in different patches where, where we could see visible differences and, and done testing there, but it definitely did help with um, getting quickly that comprehensive soil testing done. And it did definitely push us to get these pastures done as well. Uh, another thing that helped was actually having Lisa on the phone and, and talking through this, uh, the soil test results. And I know for other producers that participated in it, there was a webinar as well that they got a lot out of. Um, and it did keep us very committed to getting it done. This was a picture of the paddock just a couple of weeks ago. So you can see at the top of the hill, it's all, it's all dried off now. I have gone easy on it this year, given it's a new pasture. I didn't want to ruin it just yet. I want to look after it as much as we can. Um, and so despite the challenges we've had and, and the legacies that we're living with while we go through this, um, it has been overall positive because we can see now how these species are performing. And, um, what we also learnt was that, um, you know, we, we will be able to achieve at least 65% of the perennial place under perennial pasture in the next four years. We've just got to be able to manage stock around it as well in, times, in terms of timing. And, you know, just getting that soil right in the first place is essential. Um, what we've also learnt is that we had a lot of discussions, I guess because of my background and, and, and who I know, we, we had a lot of discussions around the lime, how the liming rates were calculated and, and whether the incremental testing was right. And, and, and I think what happened between the start of this project and now is that we have a, had a shift in best practice around soil testing, incremental sampling and, and calculating lime rates. I still don't think liming applications and, and calculating those is... Um, accessible enough to producers. It needs to become easier yet, and there's obviously projects trying to do that now. Um, and we do need to understand the impact of those large liming applications on paddock performance in subsequent years, because it has bitten us. I would have liked to have done more testing to really find out what happened there, um, but we kind of think we know what, what was going on. Um, Paddock preparation, obviously essential, and it has actually, we have learnt to improve, we have improved our gear. We now own a speed tiller and a disc tine, but sometimes the seasons are against you, and it, I think half of our issues was just managing tough seasons. So you can see, that's my husband bogged in the paddock there. Uh, wasn't much fun that day. Finally, thank you to Riverina LLS team for um, your support of us through this project and the National Land Care Program for funding it. And of course, I've got a very, very patient husband with all this sort of stuff who um, is probably used to dealing with bigger paddocks with less problems than what I give him. So <laughs> a, a bit of a shout out to, to him as well for his contribution. So thank you. Thanks, Alison. Thanks, Alison. Uh, and again, Alison will be back up in our uh, Q&A session ready for those hot questions.